storyteller, I like to start off creating the storytelling circle. The storytellers have done all over the world for hundreds of years. And I'm going to open with a folk tale. Because this folk tale will help you to see and understand why the Underground Railroad existed. There was once this hunter walking through the forest with his hunting bag. And he heard in the distance a sound he had never heard before. Na, 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 na. So he kept walking, and the sound got louder. And finally, he came to this tree, and he looked up. And there was this beautiful golden feathered bird singing. Na, 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 na. And he looked up and he said, why is such a beautiful bird singing such an ugly song? And the bird looked down and said, na, 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 na. If you don't stop singing that ugly song, I'm going to shoot you. Na, 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 na. So that hunter took out an arrow and shot at the bird and missed her. Na 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 And he was so angry, he took out another arrow, aimed very carefully, and shot the bird straight in the heart. Ran after, and caught him in his bag, tied up his bag, and walked home. And just as he was stepping in his house, he could hear hear coming from the bag. <laughs> so cut off the bird's head, plucked the feathers, cut it up into a hundred pieces, and put it in a pot of boiling water. And then he started to walk away and heard <laughs> So he took the pot, poured the water out, went outside, got a shovel, dug a deep, deep hole, poured the pieces of the bird in it, covered it with dirt, started to walk back to the house and couldn't believe it when he heard <laughs> So he went in the house, he got a box, wooden box, a chain, and a lock. Went back outside, dug up all that dirt, picked up all 100 pieces of the bird, put them in the wooden box, put the chain around the box, locked it, went to his boat, rowed out to the middle of the river, where it was the deepest, and dropped the box into the river and waited. When he didn't hear anything, he was quite happy and went home. Over time, the current pushed the box until it landed up on a riverbank. One day, there was a group of women, about your age, out at a picnic. And one of them saw this box. And they said, look, it might be a treasure chest in here. So they got a rock, broke the lock, unwrapped the chains, lifted up the box, and out flew one golden bird. And then another, and another, and another. <laughs> And they were all singing, na, 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 na. Well, about a year later, that same hunter was in the forest as he did every year. But he could not believe it when he heard in the distance, na, 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 na. So he walked on, came to that same tree and looked up and saw not one golden bird, but one hundred golden birds, all singing, na, 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 na. And the hunter looked up and he said, now I know who you are because you cannot be killed. You are the freedom bird. <laughs> and they all sang, na, 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 na. Na, na. And freedom is what the Underground Railroad was about. And it existed for many reasons. One of those reasons were that people were able to walk in the shoes of someone else. It was people, free people, free black people and white people who were able to sympathize and put themselves in positions of the slaves. Now, a lot of people didn't know what that experience was like, and were fortunate that there were many slaves 
who, once they got their freedom, wrote autobiographies. And this was one written by a slave named, his African name was Olado Equiano. And in 1756, he wrote about how he felt when he first stepped on the slave ship. I was carried on board. I was immediately handled and tossed up to see if I were sound by some of the crew. And I was now persuaded that I had gotten into a world of bad <coughs> spirits and that they were going to kill me. Their white complexions, too, differed so much from ours. Their long hair and the language they spoke united to confirm me in this belief. When I looked around the ship, and saw a furnace of copper broiling and a multitude of black people of every description chained together, every one of their countenances expressing dejection and sorrow. I no longer doubted of my fate, and quite overpowered with horror and anguish, I fell motionless on the deck and fainted. When I recovered a little, I found some black people about me who I believed were some of those who had brought me on board and had been receiving their pay. They talked to me in order to cheer me, but all in vain. I asked them if we were not to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces, and long hair. And this was quite a shock to Olada because his people in the country came from Benin were known for cheerfulness and friendliness. And it was that cheerfulness and friendliness and openness of the African people which the Europeans first encountered, the Portuguese encountered in the 1400s when they first came to West Africa. And they found gold, people making uh, metal crafts, beautiful weavings, things and spices and foods that they didn't have in Europe. So quickly trade began. And in the meantime, in the West was the country called America, which was also being explored by Europeans and it was rich soil to grow a lot of things. And they needed people to work this land. While the Africans had had slaves, which were usually prisoners of war. So it wasn't unusual for them to start and getting engaged in the slave trade. But from the very beginning, black people, the Africans, resisted <coughs> being taken, especially as they started to see that the nature of this slavery with the Europeans was different from the nature of the slavery they experienced in Africa. Because in Africa, even though they were taken as a slave, they became part of the community. They lived the same way everyone else did. So once it became known that this was not the same type of thing, people would try to avoid getting captured. If they were captured, there were thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, who never made it across the Middle Passage from Africa to the United States, across the Atlantic. <coughs> they would take poison, they would kill themselves, they would jump off the ships, they would kill their children. But eventually, there were those who had children and didn't want to kill who made it to the seller's pocket. And then, once they were enslaved and taken to these large plantations, which ultimately, the largest plantations were many kingdoms. Everything a person needed, from food to clothing, metal work, everything was contained on a plantation. And the slaves did all of this work because they came they brought from Africa the most talented, the most intelligent, the hardest working, the strongest. And blacksmithing, weaving, taking care of children, and of course, the hard labor in the farms. Now, before the Underground Railroad officially began, black people were engaged in resistance. The most subtle and obvious form of resistance resulted in black people being called lazy and shiftless for decades. Because the Africans were used to a system of trade and commerce in Africa. And when they were not getting any kind of reciprocity for what they were doing, many of them did not give their best. They would work as little as they could. 
They would take what they needed when they could. And then a lot of the young men would leave the plantations when they wanted to, if they had a girlfriend or a wife in another plantation. And then there were those strong, brave, lucky few who were determined to find their way to freedom, to find their way to this place called the North. Now, it is said that in 1830, 1831, there was a slave who was escaping from Kentucky named Ty Davis. And his owner was right on his trail, right just behind him, up until he got to the Ohio River. And Ty got to the Ohio River, and his owner said he just disappeared. And his owner was walking the streets, the streets of Ripley, Ohio, which was a totally abolitionist town. And he said, it's just as if that boy disappeared on an underground road. And that's the first time it was recorded to have been used as an underground. And pretty soon it started to be called the Underground Railroad because the railroads were being built about the same time. And there were many slaves who actually used the above ground railroads to escape. One of the most famous, excuse me, was Frederick Douglass. Now, the Underground Railroad evolved. First, to me, the Underground Railroad started in Africa with those first slaves who resisted <coughs> being kidnapped, being taken. The Underground Railroad is any attempt, any method the black people use to gain their freedom. And that came not only through the help of, of abolitionists, but also through the courts. And also, there were those who believed in violence, <coughs> in armed rebellion. And the Africans had armed rebellions against slavery from as early as the 1700s. But the most well-known rebellion occurred in 1831, in August and it was led by a man named Nat Turner. Now Nat Turner felt he was special. And this is how he explained why he led that armed rebellion against white people in Virginia in 1831. When I was three or four years old, I was telling my playmates something that had happened before I was born. People said I would surely be a prophet. One day when a book was shown to me, I began spelling the names of different objects. Whenever I was able to look at a book, I would find many things that my firm imagination had depicted to me before. As I was praying one day at my plow, a spirit that spoke to the prophets in former days said to me, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. I felt that I was ordained for some great purpose in the hands of the Almighty. Several years later, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the Spirit instantly appeared. It said that by a sign, an eclipse of the sun, heaven would make known to me when I should arise and slay my enemies with their own <coughs> weapons. Unfortunately, every attempt for a violent revolution failed, not only by the black people, but even by the white people, John Brown, because the American government has always had more arms than its people. And what was worse than the failure of, the rebel, of Nat Turner's attempt was the harshness of the justice that was descended on the slaves. 57 white people were killed by Nat Turner and his companions. But many more black slaves were killed and terrorized during the two months it took for the whites to capture that turtle. After he was captured, states throughout the South <coughs> made harsher black codes, the laws governing slaves. And one of the worst was it became against the law to teach a slave to read or write, because many felt 
that it was his knowledge of the Bible, reading the Bible, which led him to believe he had this great purpose. Now, at the same time that Nat Turner's revolution was failing in the South, white men from the East Coast and the South were moving west to the new Iowa Territory. The white people who came from the East, most of them were already philosophically, religiously opposed to slavery. The men coming from the South were also opposed to slavery, usually not for any noble reasons other than the fact that not being plantation owners, not being slave owners, Many of the white people in the South lived worse than the slaves because there was no commerce. There was no trade. They couldn't make a living because slave owners had free labor. So in 1839, at the first Iowa territorial legislature held in Burlington, they were quite proud of saying that Iowa is a free state, but as most states in the north and surrounding countries, they had to have an act regulating <coughs> blacks and mulattoes. And this act required any black person who wanted to live in the state of Iowa, they had to have physical proof that they were free. They had to post a $500 bond. They could not vote. They could not attend public schools. They could not serve on a jury. They could not bear witness against a white person. They could not receive any public assistance. But they could live and work as free people in the state. And this was further confirmed that same year in the courts of Iowa. The first Supreme Court case held in Iowa, which was recorded, was the case of Ralph Montgomery. He was a slave who was owned by a young man named Jordan Montgomery. And in 1832, Jordan told Ralph, you can go to Dubuque, work in the mines, and when you get $550, you're a free man. But if you don't get it by 1835, I'm going to start charging interest. Well, Ralph went to Dubuque. He was a terrible miner. He just was able to make enough money to keep himself food and housed. But Ralph was a nice guy, and he made friends with an Irish miner who was very successful named Alexander Butterworth. Mr. Butterworth had a golden hand. He was good in his mind, he was a farmer, and he was a partner of a local store. And he knew Ralph well. By 1839, on the other hand, Jordan Montgomery was continuing to have financial problems. So he hired two slave catchers from Virginia to go get his slave, Ralph, so he could <coughs> sell Ralph. And this is after Ralph had been living in Ireland for seven years. So they came, went to the sheriff with their papers, and of course the sheriff let them have Ralph because part of the law was that an escaped slave could be returned to the owner. But Alexander Butterworth, when he heard about this, he was very upset. He went to his friend who was a judge and got rid of habeas corpus so that Ralph could be returned. And they immediately called a Supreme, the Supreme Court to decide on the status of Ralph, considering that there were kind of this conflict in the law. Ralph was very fortunate that his lawyer was a man named David Rohrer. David Rohrer had been a slave owner in Virginia. But at some point in his life, between Virginia and Arkansas, he decided that slavery was wrong. He freed his slaves, and he began working against slavery. And one of the things he did was defended Ralph. And the Supreme Court agreed with David Rohrer, and they made this decision. The master who permits his slave to become a resident here cannot, afterwards, exercise any acts of ownership over him within this territory. The law does not take away his property in express terms but declares it no longer to be property at all. Property in the slave cannot exist without the existence of slavery. The prohibition of the latter annihilates the former. And this being destroyed, he becomes free. 
It is therefore ordered and adjudged that he, Ralph, be discharged from further duress and restraint, and that he go hence. And Ralph stayed and lived in Berlin, Burlington the rest of his life and became a part of the community. And in another part in Iowa, there was a similar case with a woman named Rachel. And so it was established that you could not bring a person and bring your slave into the state and leave that person here and think that you could claim it again because Iowa was a free state. And Iowans were proud of that. But like I said, there were some, especially in southern Iowa, the white people who were close to Missouri and kind of sympathetic to slaveholders who didn't endorse helping slaves escape. But by 1850, things changed dramatically because that was when the second fugitive slave law was passed. The first one had been passed in 1793 with the invention of the country. This fugitive slave law went so far as to say that a slave catcher could go into any state and with very little proof take a slave back south. These new states were very upset about this because state rights was very important to people. So even many more people became involved in helping slaves escape. Now Iowa had several freedom trails. There were people who came up from the south from Missouri and also from the west from Nebraska. Some people who came from Missouri came up through Cincinnati and went through other towns, all heading pretty much east to the uh, port cities of Burlington, Davenport, Clinton. And then on the west, in Nebraska, there was Tabor, Civil Bend, and other places where people came in because there were slaves in Nebraska. And Tabor, which is to the west, there was the Todd House. And all of these are houses that I'm going to mention now have been documented as Underground Railroad houses, and several of them you can actually go and visit now. And the Todd House was the home of Reverend John Todd, who was a congregation <coughs> minister. And John Brown came to his house quite often. In fact, John Brown frequented Iowa and its houses a lot. And this was something I did in all my life. I'd grown up hearing about John Brown and Harper's Ferry. But they did tell us that before Harper's Ferry, John Brown had devoted his life 20 to 30 years as an abolitionist helping hundreds of black people escape slavery. He only resorted to violence, and it was in 1859 because nothing was changing, and it was right before the Civil War when the country itself had to go into violence. It's totally in the slavery. So Reverend John Brown actually hid slaves in Todd's house, and he actually even hid arms on occasion in Reverend Todd's house, not telling him what his plans were. Another minister from the Congregational Church was Reverend George Hitchcock, who was actually recruited by Reverend Todd. And Reverend Hitchcock lived in Lewis, Iowa, and he had what's called the Hitchcock House, where slaves also were hidden. And it's said that Reverend Hitchcock was a very audacious man because he would ride through the town in a carriage with a woman sitting next to him with her bonnet on and her clothes and her gloves straight through the city, straight on through, and it would be black women he'd be helping to get their freedom. And then in Salem was the Henderson Llewellyn home, which Miss Garrison knows about. He's telling me some more stories about. Now Henderson Llewellyn was a Quaker. And he and his brother and others had joined a Quaker community in Salem. Now, by and large, the Quakers, the Friends, were one of the first religious groups to come out against slavery on a religious basis. But within the Quaker churches, there was a split. Everyone agreed slavery was an abomination. But there were some who felt that as Quakers, as pacifists, they could not be involved in breaking the law and help the slaves escape because no matter how nonviolent you were on occasion, 
those ventures ended up being violent. Well, Henderson Llewellyn was not of that mind. So in 1843, he formed the Abolition Friends Monthly Meeting, and they were a totally separate group. And as Garrison said, they actually have totally separate places in the uh, graveyards now of the two different groups of people. But Henderson <coughs> Llewellyn's house was used and house, he helped many slaves through. Joshua Henshaw was another abolitionist, and he lived in Winterset, Iowa. But one early morning, two slaves came knocking on his door. Please, sir, the posse's out there. She's got to hide us. And so Mr. Henshaw and his sons quickly hid these men. The posse came, ran through his house looking for people, went to the barn, punching hay stacks and grain with long poles and left very angrily because they couldn't find anything. They had walked right past two large barrels sitting in the yard that had a plank of corn seed drying. Very carefully, Mr. Henshaw and his son lifted up the plank and up jumped two black men who started singing. When the sun comes up and the first quail calls, Follow the drinking board, for the old man's a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking board. Mr. Henshaw looked and said, what are y'all saying about? And they said, well, sir, it's going to be winter, and it's definitely time for us to follow that North Star, the drinking gourd, and make our way across the Ohio River. And that was just one of the many songs that the black people used as codes to help them escape to freedom. And that song specifically, it is said, was taught to slaves in the Deep South by a traveling carpenter, a white man, because the song goes on to tell them how to follow the river that is in Alabama and how to get through the to the Tennessee River to the Ohio River. And it would take about a year. And the goal was to cross the Ohio River in the winter when it was frozen over because it could be a rough river to cross otherwise, even though there's a story of Eliza who did cross it with her child. And that story in Uncle Tom's Cabin is based on a true woman who did cross the river with her baby. And that was a very rare occasion for a woman to make that type of an attempt for freedom because of the difficulties. Now, in Des Moines, there was a place called Cherry Place, which now has the old historical building is located there. But during the 1800s, there was a nice large house surrounded by cherry trees, and Isaac Grant, the postmaster general of the state, lived there. And he was an abolitionist. And this is what he wrote in 1864. The last time I saw John Brown was at this gate. As we leaned over it, he took my hand and held it a long time, then spoke a few words of kindness and courage and went on. This was in 1859, in the early part of the year, only a short time before he went on to Harper's Ferry. I had met him on other occasions. It was a winter day. But I was out in the yard when I saw a covered wagon drawn along the rough road with a man walking at the side whom I recognized at once. He halted at my place and I called him to the gate. I saw that he had a load in his wagon and gave him the signal for safety and he understood. I asked him how many and he held up four fingers in his hand. It was early in the day and he went on eastward with his father, as we would have said. But in the few words exchanged, he showed his passionate earnestness and the cause to which he had dedicated his life. Not far away, there were places where he might have hid away for a night or day those whom he was helping. But it was better to go on to places not so conspicuous. How did Brown know I could be trusted? 
Well, even if he had not met me before, he knew it when I said, hello, much as we now do at the telephone. That was a pretty well-established underground railroad signal for all's well. In response, he lifted his right hand to his ear and grasped the rim firmly between the thumb and finger. That meant he understood. If he had held up his hand with the palm extended outward, it would have been different. Do not know how these signs or signals originated, but they had become well understood. Without them, the operation of the system of running slaves into a free territory would not have been possible. Not only was the traffic illegal, but in every community, even in Iowa, there were some who opposed. Brown knew by the signals that I was a friend. No, John Brown did not tell me any of the details of his plans that had long before been matured, but he let me know he had plans and that nothing could turn him aside. And it was the symbols and the language that Brad talked about was just one of the ways that people communicated. Songs were another. And then, as Ms. Garrison mentioned, they are also quilts and designs of quilts. It hasn't been documented that the abolitionists here in Iowa actually used quilts. But in other places in the South and in the North, quilts were used in two ways. One, the slaves who were seamstresses who made quilts as part of their jobs. You also had symbols and traditions from Africa which made quilts with specific symbols that could tell a story or give directions. And they used designs like the log cabin, the North Star, uh, the traveling drunkard, different specific ones which people could use, and there were even some that were said they could actually tell people how and directions to go. And another way that quilts were used was that they would be simply hung out, as, and if they would have a black patch in the middle, people would know this is a safe house. Other symbols of safe house would have a lantern in a kitchen window. And another symbol was also people would have the young boy carvings that looked like a um, young boy who was holding a horse and which people had grown to think were racist. But they would light this candle. And I just found out from a trip to um, Baltimore that that young boy was the first carving of this young boy was commissioned by George Washington president because this young boy and his father were with Washington during the revolution and his father's actually if you look at that picture with them on a boat there's actually he's painted there's a black man that was the boy's father and the young boy would hold Washington's horse at some point during the revolution the boy died and Washington had the sculpture built in memory of this little boy who worked for him. <clears throat> now, after 1850, the worst part of that fugitive slave law was that it was used not only to capture escaped slaves, but to put free blacks into slavery. And we don't know how many, but it's probably into the thousands of black people who are unfortunate enough to get literally kidnapped by slave catchers and placed into slavery. And some of them never got out until the end of the Civil War. And this same kind of thing happened here in Iowa. There was a town on the west, western border of Iowa called Civil Bend. It doesn't exist anymore. And there was an abolitionist, Reverend Doc Blanchard, who came to Civil Bend from Nebraska. And he brought a free black family with him called the Garners. They moved into the community. They were welcomed in the community by most people. And their children were invited to attend the school. 
A week after the children attended the school, the school was shut down. But they continued living there. One day, Henry Garner and her brother, I mean, the sister Maria, and a friend named John Williamson were riding on their way to Omaha in a carriage. And approaching them down the road was another carriage with several white men, and they didn't think anything of it until the other carriage came right up beside him. The white men jumped off the carriage, hit Henry so hard, and broke his jaw. But they weren't able to control John Williamson, and he got away. And John Williamson went right away to Doc Blanchard, and he got some more white men, and they used their connections and found out that Henry and Maria had been taken to a slave jail in St. Louis, awaiting literally to be sold into slavery. But Doc Blanchard was able to prove that they were free people, and they were brought back. And they were very fortunate because there were many other slaves, people who, I mean, many other black people who were li living all the way up on the East Coast. After 1850, the slave catchers went that far to bring people and kidnap them into the South. Because as time passed on, the slave trade ended in the early 1800s, the international slave trade. The United States was, no, Brazil was the last country to end the international slave trade. The Amistad case was successful because those slaves were picked up after the international slave trade ended. So slavery, smuggling continued almost up until the Civil War. But slavery was so interwoven and in the basis of the economy. And a lot of people always point their fingers at the South, but actually the Northeast was built on the international slave trade. The people who built the ships and transported the slaves all were from the Northeast. And they made money like we can't imagine, even then. And so it was, but the pop of this, but they could not use slaves in the Northeast. They did the farming and that, and then the whole politics. So slavery was gradually, step by step, outlawed in the Northeast and the North until it became a federal issue with new states coming in. And so, but the money continued to be made in the South. And see, what happened is that once the international slave trade ended, the Northeast wasn't making any money. So that was, aside from the moral issues, there was this economic issue, too, that the Northeast was not making any money for slavery and people were seeing how bad it was. But at that same time, this was like at the height of the South was profiting from slavery. Because even after the end of the international slave trade, the natural production, birth of slaves, continued on its own and people made money by selling slaves and by actually, just the same way they do on the stock market, with futures. Futures in slaves, like they have futures in beef and beans. So by 1850 and the whole thing, there was a whole, the, the South was making money hands over fists and they didn't want to give it up. So aside from the moral issue, there was a very heavy economic factor in the Civil War. And by 1860, Things were coming to a head. And this is from an editorial that was written in the Iowa State Register about the kidnapping of slaves. Much, and it was written October 10, 1860. Much is said by the pro-slavery party about the great wrong inflicted by abolitionists in abducting slaves and hurrying them through to Canada. But little is said in condemnation by the same party when free citizens of the state of Iowa are attacked by pro-slavery ruffians, bound hand and foot, separated from their families, and given over to the everlasting curse of human bondage. It is wrong, we admit, to invade the sovereignty of states and wrest from slaveholders their constitutional rights. But it is an evil of greater magnitude to convert a free man into a subject 
of merchandise and oppression. It is difficult for Iowa supporters of slavery to understand that sovereignty is not confined to slaveholding states. They ignore the fact that Iowa and all the elements of state sovereignty is equal to her sisters in the Confederacy. They forget that this system of kidnapping citizens of Iowa by Missouri's constitutes as gross an assault on state rights and prerogatives as the inexcusable forays of abolitionists on Virginia. And strangely indifferent to the dignity of the local constitution under which they live, they follow the memory of John Brown with execrations and yet have no word a scorching rebuke for those prowling manhunters who have assailed our constitutional rights and dragged our free citizens away into slavery. So even in Iowa, you can see how things had heated up just before the Civil War started. And of course, with the Civil War, the first slave, all the slaves who were in the states that had seceded with the Emancipation Proclamation were declared free, although there were some who never found that out until after the Civil War. Especially in Texas, they didn't find out until June 19th in 1865, and that was the beginning how Juneteenth evolved. And then after the Civil War, then, of course, there had to be an amendment to free slaves in the, who, were part, who were still enslaved as part of the Union. Now, after the Civil War, Iowa, was very progressive because during the Civil War, black people were finally allowed to fight in the war, black men, through the efforts of Frederick Douglass. And in Iowa, they fought so bravely and so impressed the white men who were in the state legislature that before 1900 and before the federal government had passed it, black men could vote in Iowa. Before 1900, all black people had the right for integrated education and full civil rights in Iowa by law. Unfortunately, there were so, still mean so few people, black people in the state. Currently, the state has pretty much remained with 2% of the population of the state of Iowa are black. But here in the 21st century, 25% of the state's population incarcerated are black. This does, and I know and everyone knows that black people are not inherently more prone to be criminals. And this is why I like to tell underground railroad stories because I feel that now, and this is not just a phenomenon in Iowa. In general, throughout the country, there are more, proportionately more black people in prisons than in the population. But in the states that have a lower percentage of black people, the, there are a greater number percentage-wise in their jails, much more. That's why it's called disproportionate confinement. And I think the Underground Railroad stories are important to remind people that there was a time when black people and white people worked together very intimately over a long period of time, longer than the Civil Rights Movement, and in a different manner than the Civil Rights Movement, because there were white people who actively <coughs> worked in the Civil Rights Movement who also lost their lives, but there weren't as many who were opening their homes to people, to actually spend time and days, and there were thousands, hundreds of thousands who went through the homes of white people through the Underground Railroad. And so there was a working together to bring justice and freedom to people, and now in the 21st century, the challenge is for people to recognize the institutional racism which allows this injustice, to acknowledge the personal prejudice and the practices of people who don't, because there's so few black people, don't encounter them that often, and to fight against those so that we can bring down this great gross injustice of having too many people of color in jails. And not only what, and the other thing that once they're in the jail, there's a cycle that's created. 
You go into jail, you're a person of color, you create, commit a felony, you come out in the state of Iowa, you can't vote. You're a non-citizen. You can't vote, you can't get a job from it. And so if you have a family, you're struggling, they end up committing a crime and it ends up being an endless cycle. The same thing with the education. And then the state doesn't spend enough money on education, so the young children in the schools, and it becomes an endless cycle. So when we see these connections, and remember that this state is really a very progressive state, and the finding of the these leaders who recognize the fact that black men have fought in the Civil War, and it's time for us to recognize that there should be a union and an effort to end these kinds of ignorance and injustice and to really attack the institutional racism which allows it to happen. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions anybody may have. This is just a rally that came from a West African country. I bought it in uh, Des Moines at a shop that opened for a short, little while. But these are actually seed pods. Oh, They're actually so seed pods. And it just is, it creates a nice energy. Yes. Were there any other questions? Well, thank you. I know I kept you a little bit longer than usual. That's a nice <laughs> and, and I've gotten most of the Iowa information. I was very fortunate. I was explaining to um, Nancy and Susan that I got this information through the Iowa Historical Society through John Zellner, who is a young man doing their research because the um, Historical Society is in the process of documenting what they call the Iowa Freedom Trail. And since I started my research, the number of houses that have been listed under the Park Service's Network of Freedom for Iowa have increased significantly because the Park Service has a ruling process to document houses because they, they, they very much want, there's a continuing debate among historians about the value of oral history. And so what they do is they have several means and methods that people have to prove that site was used for the Underground Railroad. And so they, Iowa was getting more of that. The goal ultimately is to have markers even at those sites that no longer exist. Yes, ma'am. I do want to say, too, there's a marvelous book called Outside In, which is a history of African Americans in Iowa from the early 1800s. That's a fascinating <coughs> history, and it's done by occupation, which I think makes it, kind of gives it a, another interesting factor. And I used that too, and, and Galen Barrier, who wrote the chapter on Underground Railroad, I, he was one of my consultants, and I attended his workshop too. Yes, ma'am. Um, I used to live at Oskaloosa, and we would come to Des Moines and eventually moved here, and uh, we were told what two homes were pointed out to us as Underground Railroad homes, and they were both lovely, very lovely brick homes. And I don't know if it's the truth or not. Right. That's what we were told. Yeah, that's, and see, that's, it's, it's a pretty difficult process that, to go through, but it's worth it for people who, who really want, because when I was in one town, I think in Burlington, there was a church, and they were in the process of trying to get their church document, and they were saying, it's so hard, because they want to have all this and that. But for the sake of history, you know, the longer and longer we get away from it, historically, the science of history, they want to have that exact. And it's also important because as time goes on, when you have solid proof, it won't be 300 years from now, we won't have people saying there wasn't slavery in America. You know, they'll have, they're saying this historically is documented, just like, you know, there's people who try to say there wasn't concentration camps in Germany. When they have the historic proof of it, and that's why it's important. That's why they have such a rigorous process for the sites to be to be documented. And as a storyteller, I have a little bit more leeway because I'm not a historian. But everything that I've talked about today and all the quotes are everything that I've read today are come from historical documents. Other than the hotel, yes, ma'am. Do you know what years the Jordan House operated as? Actually. 
not the exact years, but most of the houses in Iowa, Iowa were in operation pretty much from the 1830s to up until the Civil War. They weren't maybe 1820s, but most of them started in the 1830s simply because there wasn't too many people in the territory before the 1830s. In the case I, I told you about, um, there were two bounty hunters they had hired, the Texan, or the Missouri uh, slave owners had hired these two bounty hunters from Texas. And when the case came up, then they had de depositions from these um, Texans. And they took depositions because these men were wanting to go to California for the gold rush, uh -huh. which it just is indicative of the people that were out there. Uh, fortune hunters, they were uh, being slave catchers, or, well, there's an opportunity in California, so away they went. But they did have the depositions from them, and they had been hired to, to trace these, this particular group. And I'm sorry, I can't remember how many were in it. Yeah, I wondered what gave you the calling to become a storyteller? Well, I was a performance artist for many years. I was a dancer, a writer, and a poet. And I did that for about 10, 15 years. And then I went back to college. And I had a work study job in a theater. And one day I was in there, and the late woman had a little folded up brochure of a black woman who performed in colleges and high schools, and she was a storyteller. And I said, wow, that's pretty interesting, because the folder was like things I had used, but I had never had that type of experience. And I told the woman I was working with, and she said, well, here, you probably want to read this book. And it was a textbook written by a woman named Norma Lego, who was a professor at the University of Colorado in Denver. And when I finished reading that, I said, well, this is just perfect for me because it combines everything I've ever done, which is reading, research, and storytelling. Unlike the performing I used to do, because I would be performing, I'd be dancing and performing things I had written, which were very personal. Mm -hmm. I started off doing folk tales. They're totally impersonal. They're totally not mine. And from the first story I told, it was like, being in heaven. It's like, I love doing it. I didn't feel, sometimes I get nervous, but not too much. It was just that I was sharing something that I liked so much, and the reception has been always, pretty much by and large, very, very good on that level. And that's how I got into it, because as I got into it, I realized, well, I've been a storyteller all my life. I've written and I told stories even when I was a little child, but I, I did not know it was a career and that people could do it until I had found out out of college. You have a good voice, too. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.